Hey, this is Ross Bain with Roleplaying Public Radio. We are doing RPPR episode 156, Origins Wrap-Up. Uh, this is our very first uh, time at Origins, yep. which is a fairly large convention with 15,000 people. So, uh, I think it's the second biggest, isn't it, after yeah, DragonCon? Uh, probably. I think DragonCon's close, but I don't think it's quite Origins size. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm Caleb, by the way. <laughs> yes, and with me, uh, not as always, is Caleb Yeah, as our special guest. Um, Quip about announcer voice. There we go. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you, we you fulfilled the the, the right, the contractual obligation. The, yeah, the passages. <laughs> Somewhere, Tom invoking an episode off in the distance. His eyes losing focus. <laughs> <laughs> Just in general, it's got nothing going to do with doing here. State, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, uh, uh, Caleb uh, decided to go to Origins to sell red markets at the IGDN booth. And, or, and Party Foul. And Party Foul. I've heard about that. Uh, yes, Party Foul on Kickstarter. Uh, I will try and get this episode up tomorrow. So, so for one more day. Yeah, one more day. Um, and I just tagged along because I wanted to go because, you know, I haven't been. Yeah. And I decided... To make a bold stand of not running the events uh, at Origins, it was a yeah. brave decision <laughs> to just be a con. That's, that's a word. <laughs> yeah, uh, it paid off. Weirdly, Sarah enough. heroically also didn't run yep. events. Yep, heroically <laughs> attended. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, it was it was quite rewarding. Actually, it turns out it, going to a convention to play games that you're interested in is actually can be really fun. You know, <laughs> yeah. Do you not have fun when you run events, Ross? Uh, I Is mean, they're, fu- but they're, they're, they're tiring. Events? They're tiring. <laughs> these, these, this was invigorating. You know. Like, All right, you heard your first, Ross Payton. Whoa. You are a chore to him. Oh God. Okay, <laughs> you're just twisting my words around. All right. Uh, so, um, we bought both of us bought a lot of stuff there. Um, <laughs> way too much. Yeah, way too much. Uh, so it we're not, not a profitable venture, and that is entirely my fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, Red Market's uh, sold pretty well, from what I understand. Yeah, we, we sold about 10 books, Yeah, so that's good. Um, and the, yeah, yeah, so uh, the thing is, uh, in terms of the pur- purchases, we won't list everything we bought because we haven't gone through all of it yet. Uh, I think speak for yourself. Okay, <laughs> um, that's all I did yesterday was assemble board games. <laughs> nice and organize them. Well, I bought a lot of books that I'm still not done. Uh, yeah, uh, I had to go out today and buy a new shelf. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. These are all things I did. <laughs> that's that. I mean, that's kind of an achievement. Bought so many get board games at a convention that you literally needed new furniture. Yep. All right. Uh, congratulations. Living the dream. You are. Um, I yeah I got I did get like Fall of Delta Green and Hollow Moon Bound a lot of other books so I haven't been able to read them all yet uh, but uh, I, so I want to focus on when talking about Origins um, first of just I guess ov- overall impression of it um, I overall I, obviously I really liked it uh, downtown Columbus Ohio where they have the con center uh, is it's not as vast as the Indianapolis Convention Center but it's. Uh, Big. Far better for a convention in many ways. I I, I found it. Um, yeah. I found downtown uh, Columbus a lot more hospitable than I do uh, downtown Indianapolis because it mm-hmm. still had a stupefying level of road work as was always be found at any Gen Con. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but there was, uh, a, a lot of restaurants and a lot of them were in walking distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were not pleased with the variety of them and you were keen to let us know as it's if I was the city so planner, many. as if I was the city planner of Columbus and had any control of Pub it, bars but bars you just girls. really wanted us to know that. And it all, but there were so many that I could find a place to eat yeah. very quickly near the convention center. Uh, rather than having to like get into a car and and drive away from it like I normally do in yeah. Indianapolis, um, so yeah, I liked it a lot. It's a very it's a smaller size, in other words. It's much smaller. Um, amongst the designers, it's a lot more laid back. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not laid back. There's still a lot of business going on. Yeah. So I wasn't even try- seeking meetings, and I ended up in three or four meetings with different game designers, and there were people there working the IGDN booth that were. I, I met one person that had sold 16 board games that con like to different publishers. So um, like, it's just a lot of wheeling and dealing and stuff, but it's also very social because unlike Gen Con at origins, not every 
second of your life is scheduled from mm-hmm. 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Like, <laughs> no, sorry, from 6 a.m. to the next day is 1 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, a lot more people talking around, things like that. It is far more of a board game convention, though. Yeah, that's um, certainly true. There was some RPG presence, but uh, everyone from board gaming was there, with the exception of Fantasy Flight and Asmo Day. There was, I mean, come on, Yellow, uh, Pandasaurus, mm-hmm. Atlas. I mean, pr- pretty much everybody was there with big, honking, serious booths as well. In addition to all of the uh, board game accoutrements, so like Broken Token had a massive booth in there for inserts. Yeah. There were multiple competing insert companies. Uh, WizKids had an enormous booth there. Uh, so it is a it is a board gaming convention. It is yeah. very very hard in the paint on that. They they also they have three exhibit halls and two of them have a couple of vendors each, but the ones flanking the main exhibit hall, but they're primarily set up as play areas for like organized play, tournaments, yeah. demos. Um and I found that quite interesting because um you yeah, and like painting, like learn how to paint miniatures mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, good name, good number of fan communities, and I'll get into that a little more of like fan groups that are wanting to run. Uh, games, much yeah. smaller seminar circuit too. Yeah, it's not. It's not a. I didn't even try to go to any seminar. Giant this year, panel but. thing, but like, yeah, they they it's in one hallway of the convention center. Yeah, it's, like, it's very small. Yeah, it's compared to like entire buildings worth of panels and seminars at Gen yeah. Con. Um, so there's that. Uh, the it's very lighthearted. Everyone's kind of there to have fun. Um. A lot of people there are on educator passes. It's extremely affordable, mm-hmm. um, even if you're not. But like Sarah and I went in on an educator path, and that's thirty five bucks if you're a teacher. Um, and then there were some great teaching seminars we attended too about using games in the classroom as well. <clears throat> um, so very affordable. I will say this: they are as bad as I've ever seen. <laughs> At scheduling games in a way where you can find them. Yeah. Like, they, they have an app, but it's useless. Only, like 98% useless. 90. There was 2% usefulness. <laughs> uh, there, were, there was actually, I looked up one event on it, and then it said canceled on it. I'm like, well, great. I don't have to try and find that event. Uh, they There were three gaming halls. There was a gaming hall A and a gaming hall C, and then yeah. gaming hall B was the vendor room, right? Yeah. Uh, and there were some major booths like Come On and stuff in A and C, but it was mainly play spaces. Yeah. In the fucking catalog, they misprinted everything <laughs> to have R tables when all of the R tables were in Gaming Hall C. And so they double booked, and I'm talking like hundreds of tables. Like, And so finding the game you were supposed to be in or run was finding no finding a place where you're supposed to run the game was just a fight. It was just who could argue loudest with convention staff and get their table in place. And then finding where you were going to run again, it's it's anybody's guess. Like I, I heard people like they were playing RPGs in rooms like, oh no, this RPG is supposed to be in a different hotel. But the thing is like Origins people are so used to it being so terrible. Just like, oh yeah, no, of course. We will go. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. no, it's three miles away, obviously. Like, because apparently this is like, uh, it was my first Origins, but everyone I know had been there is like, oh, yeah, Gamma. That's it. Uh, yeah, I actually. Like, that's r- it, Gamma. I, yeah, <laughs> I ran into Ken Hyden and I asked, oh, how are you doing this? I'm doing pretty great because I'm not running any events. I'm not, I don't have to, I don't have to interface directly with Gamma at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, yeah, no. Uh, so while I love it, and uh, it is very laid back, and it's very much a gamer's convention in that you were there to play games. Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, it is terrible in terms of, like, it's, uh, with, all the the, oh, yeah, with all the nightmare right. you have well, to... Well, on the front end, too. Yeah. yeah, with all the nightmare you have to deal with scheduling stuff at Gen Con, at least it's in the place where they say it's going to be most of the time. Mm-hmm. Like, that Origins, it's like... And, the on, and, the, and you can find events easily. Yeah, like, yeah. Origins, it's anybody's guess. Like, yeah. It is, that's my only complaint about it, because I very much like the area. It was a very good crowd. Um, it was big. Yeah, the there crowd, was yeah. great stuff, like mm-hmm. stuff premiering at Origins and, and stuff I'd never seen before. So I didn't get that whole, like, this isn't the new hotness thing I sometimes get at Gen Con. Yeah. And uh, I was generally very impressed. But Yeah, I mean, it's big. It's not a small con by any convention, but it's not. Like, Gen Con is so massive now. Like, if you're used to Gen Con standards, it feels like just pleasant compared to Gen yeah, Con. Yeah, I mean, the vendor hall 
at Gen Con not, is, is the crushing. size of all three of the gaming halls yeah. combined. Yeah. Like A, B, and C yeah. all put together would just make the Exhibitors Hall at Gen Con. Yeah. Um, whereas... Uh, but like it's still it's still good. Like you, at no point did I feel like there were still takes things a, it to still do. takes a good while to like browse the the range of vendors. Yeah, uh, origins um, and there was still True Dungeon and Battle yeah. Pods and VR realistic. There are, there are a lot of uh, and, RPGs. Yes, uh, uh, a lot of RPGs being played. Mm-hmm. Um, some RPGs being sold. I think IGDN was there. IPR was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cubicle Seven had a large booth. Yeah, and they were selling stuff from Arc Dream as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was not a big RPG space. That was pretty much it for RPGs that I saw. Did you see any other big RPGs? Um, let me think here. There were Wizards there, didn't have anything. There was somebody selling Wizard stuff. I can't. I think Gale Force Nine. Uh, they sell uh, D and D. Yeah, stuff. I saw a couple like game store yeah. distributors selling yeah. RPGs that were hodgepodges. But like in terms of publishers having uh, Pelgrain Press, they were there. Pelgrain was there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot about Pelgrain. Yeah, they were working with IPR. But Pelgrain, IPR, IGDN, and. Uh, Cube Seven were the only like publishers in their own discrete booths. Everybody else I yeah. saw was like selling like comic books and RPGs mm-hmm. and books, and they were just local vendors that had come in. Like, so yeah. I didn't I didn't see anybody coming from like uh, like Eclipse Days wasn't there, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was pretty nice. Yeah, if you're an RPG de- a small RPG developer, you definitely you want to work with IPR, IGDN, or something like that. Yeah. You don't go on your own, like because mm-hmm. that that the audience is obviously really board game focused. Like Board Game Geek had a huge presence there. Obviously, they were live streaming there. Yes, um, and BGG. I'm really, I'm really shocked. Fantasy Flight, yeah, and Asmo Day were not there. Um, yeah, that might might have been a budget thing for them. Or... Yeah, I mean, maybe the, their booth costs so much, like. They yeah. probably can't make their bet- metrics back. Maybe they wanted more space than that, like, Origins was able to provide. Yeah, come on, Games had, it was nuts. It had 50, yeah. it had 50 yards, it was 50 yards wide. Like, yeah. it was an enormous booth. Like, uh, good presence. Rising Sun yeah. sold out in the first two hours. Like, it yeah. was just gone. Um, I was alarmed. There were some pretty good deals, too. Like, mm-hmm. um, so I got a Wasteland Express Delivery Service, which is mm-hmm. sort of this Mad Max pick up and deliver board game. Um, that has just this insane value because, as I learned last night, they've basically cut out the broken token insert market in that it's not all just cheap shit in bags. Like, everything has its own separator. Everything has its own place. Those things are labeled. They wow. have their, Like, you overlay them. So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of these go here. Um, and from everything I saw in reviews, it's like it makes this game that's intensely complex super easy to teach and play because it, everything is laid out in this hyper-rational, logical order. And I was doing that last night, but that's a ninety dollar game, and they were selling it all con long for sixty, and I picked it up on Sunday for fifty, like which is nuts. And yeah. Like, but at the same time, I was like, I really want a Great Western Trail, which is a game about selling cows, just because it got good reviews on uh, Shut Up and Sit Down, and that was seventy bucks all weekend. And I'm just yeah. like, it's a quarter of the game as yeah <laughs> wasteland express so i i didn't end up doing that so like it's it's sort of up in the air on that but yeah yeah there's always that <laughs> some publishers are way eager way more. oh wait chaosium they had a they had a presence there too oh yeah chaosium um, had a move, yeah. i picked up the actually chaosium was pretty good because they had a lot of stuff pretty heavily discounted like mm-hmm. i picked up the uh, older edition stuff yeah, well it was all newer edition actually oh, wow. that, but like i mean i forgot yeah i was looking at the sandy peterson yeah. monster encyclopedia but. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, but they also had fiction <clears throat> and some other things over like five bucks for some mm-hmm. of their their small uh, smaller books. So I picked a, uh, picked up a couple things with them. But um, yeah, it, it, good deals. But also, you know, there's a lot of community there. One one downside is that they had an open board game library, but it cost twenty bucks to get in. Yeah, that's not great. Yeah, and the same with the video arcade, twenty bucks to get in. Games but. on demand was better. Yeah. Uh, Games of the Man. I actually did that. Uh, uh, one thing I have noticed about Origins is that Gamma is so bad. Yeah. And has been for so many years. Mm-hmm. And I was noticed this in IGDN because um, I was running Red Markets and I was being told by other designers, like, I can't believe you're not running it at Games on Demand. And I'm like, well, I'd rather know people are going to see my game and know where to find it to try it than just wander into Games on Demand. And they're just like, well, yeah, but that's Gen Con thinking. 
And I'm like, <laughs> well, what are you talking about? I was like, well, yeah, Gen Con thinking you did a great job. Offer 22 Red Markets games, sell them out. That's the way you should do it. Maybe have some people in games on the demand so they can wander in and try it. But he said everyone in Origins is spoiled by Gamma and, like, the size and that – there are people who go to Origins, and like it's far more common than Gen Con just to have nothing scheduled, and they just roll into games on demand and see what's open. Yeah, and he says that's where you sell new people on your game system at Origins. It's like you just sit in games on demand and run as many until you, as you can to your horse, your horse in the throat. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't need to do that in the future. But like, yeah, it is uh, very much. People are just there to try whatever's open. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of what I did. So, like, I got 20 bucks of generic tickets, uh, and I managed to get in four role-playing games and a couple of war game type things. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is actually uh, Wrath and Glory, the new Warhammer 40K RPG um, that uses a D6 pool system. Uh, I actually, had, the game was actually last minute replacement of GM, <laughs> speaking of Gamma Screw Ups, uh, was actually run by Ro- Ross Watson, who is the lead writer for it. Um, so, and we actually have a game of his already on this site. He, uh, uh, worked on the Savage Worlds, uh, game, A Curse, that Tom played in. Oh, yeah. Gen Con a couple years ago. So, I uh, had a nice chat with him, and it's a really fun game. I actually got, uh, the free RPG Day, uh, demo kit from it, so I'm gonna run that for RPPR at some point. Uh, you can be the Space Marine if you want, Caleb, because I know you want to be that. Uh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Pauldrons. Uh, yeah, exactly. He's got pauldrons. Uh, Who doesn't? Yeah, well, he's also got a great mustache. Most women die in childbirth in the 40K <laughs> universe just because they have to pass the pauldrons through. <laughs> they're they're, they're born on with later. Them. No, they're born with them. Uh, so... Yeah, the 40k RPG. Uh, now I didn't record these games because I just want to. I, like, I'm not running them. Nobody knows who. Well, some people knew, but like, I didn't want to be like, "Hey, can I just make everybody real anxious, nervous by recording this and posting this on a podcast?" Plus, it's a con game. You know, these are noisy rooms. Yeah. Um. So I didn't record the 40k RPG, but we did. Um, I like, didn't record Red Markets or anything yeah. like that either. Um, I, which is odd because yeah. if you want a convention to record con games at Origins, is certainly better. Than than Gen- yeah, yeah. Because again, fewer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's. It's still noisy, but it's not. The, we almost had a room to ourselves for uh, Tracy's game of Iron yeah, Etta, Iron Etta. Uh, which I've never seen at yeah. Gen Con ever. Uh, I've seen it occasionally late <laughs> at nights yeah. in the dark corners uh, at the Forgotten Hotels. Um, but yeah, the 40k RPG, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I learned the system pretty well, so I can run it now. And I actually guessed the plot, like the plot twist, like an hour before. Like he's like, "Oh wow, you guys figured out the plot before other most people have to go through a couple more scenes before they, before they put the clues together." So uh, your reward is the boss fight right now. <laughs> Demons appear and try and kill you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, it's pretty great. They have like a stunting mechanic where you can do things for effect. And so, like, the demons that we fought had regeneration, so, like, it was hard to wound them. Uh, or they, they they could soak a lot of damage. So, like, well, I'd take my combat knife and just sort of pry open his open wound so he can't regenerate anymore. And then, like, that worked. So it was teamwork, you know. <laughs> Sounds like a 40K game. It was very 40K. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, what other... Yeah, well, uh, so, yeah, you, you, you get to play some games, though, right? Uh, I did some demos. Yeah. So uh, Sarah was also there. She was. Uh, I was working the IGDN booth, so I was kind of learning how to be the weird combination of Carnival Barker slash uh, <laughs> low pressure, low stress millennial salesman that you need to be selling RPG because like the <laughs> the hard sell is not something that anyone responds to well. And, Hello, sir. Yeah, you need a fine role playing game. Yeah, that kind of shit. Or whatever. But at the same time, you can't just like stand there and seem uninterested while they look things through. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to learn that. So Sarah was buying the game. So she she demoed a lot of stuff. So she demoed uh, uh, Castle Dragon, which I'm really excited for, which yes. is a mahjong mechanic. Uh, we actually, I actually played that with her. Yeah. Um, it's a game. It's a really interesting game. I, I definitely want to play it again because I didn't understand the best like. Understood the central mechanics, but like, oh, I should do things differently if I wanted to win. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that's what you have to do. But we're getting very obsessed with like um, King Domino and Patchwork and Baron Park and mm-hmm. like placement games, tile placement games. Yeah. Well, uh, and so that was a good fit for us. Um, she's also very into deck builders. Uh, so she bought 
uh, Witches of the Revolution from Atlas Games, where you're witches trying mm-hmm. to save the American Revolution. Yeah. Uh, and I'm excited to play it and also excited to make Sarah, fun of Sarah for buying it. Uh, Whoa. Because I don't know how we're going to pitch that to Spencer. <laughs> Like, who's our primary board game? A couple friends was like, "All right, look, it's the American Revolution." Also, mm. you're witches. <laughs> and um, what's not to love? Like, <laughs> how is that not a great pitch? It's <laughs> it's good for me. I don't. Yeah. Spencer doesn't know what YouTube is. I don't. I think it might <laughs> be a little off putting. That's for true. Him. He did think ketchup is a five. Yeah. In terms um, of condiments. He's I, like I listen said, to the mix six. Yeah, like on I said, iTunes. Spencer is normal. Like other people with fuck tattooed across their neck <laughs> are. Ag- he's aggressively normal. Like. So normal, he can't have certain jobs. Like, um, so she bought that. Um, we also bought a lot, bunch of stuff we were looking for, like uh, uh, Murder of Crows. We oh, yeah, that. we played that as well. And uh, Star I picked Realms, up my own copy. I didn't realize King Domino. It, yeah, yeah we, we've done some stuff like that. And then um, I was buying RPG stuff, so I got Microscope, because I wanted to use that for our next game project. Um I was going to get Bluebeard's Bride, but you got it, so I'm going to borrow your copy. Yeah. Uh, and then... It's a beautiful book, by the way. Yes, it is I mean, gorgeous. although it's very expensive, and it's n- it's a kind of a thin book, too, so, like... Mm, it's... Yeah. The art, though, is... All, the art, yeah. You know, it, I it, feel like it's worth it in production. No, it, it, it's a book as an art object. Like, I yeah. mean, like, it's beautifully printed. But I well, couldn't so convince like, myself to buy a copy, though, because yeah. I, I can't imagine us ever playing it. Yeah. The, the subject the themes, material, yeah, yeah. yeah, is pretty intense. Um, and then I bought some ash cans, like uh, The Ward, uh, and well, Passions de las Passiones, the telenovela. <laughs> I definitely want to play game. that. Um, um, well, speaking of like sort of indie ash can games, yeah. uh, the second game I played was actually at Games on Demand. Mm-hmm. I tried to get into Blades of the Dark, but that like instantly filled up before I could. Yeah, and that's and that's yeah. what they were kind of talking about. Yeah. It like is like people go to Origins to play, and they want to try Blades in the Dark. And then no one signs up for a Blades of a Dark yeah. event. They all just go to Games on Demand and hope someone wanders by running it. And st- well, there was and- one GM doing it, and the guy like was uh, Tracy or someone was telling me like, "Oh yeah, the one Blades in the Dark GM, uh, he's like writing for it and understands the game was one playtester for it, and it would have been yeah, he's like one of the best GMs for it." And yeah, but it filled up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, but I did play a great indie sort of Ashcan game uh, called The Devil John Moulton. The Devil, comma, John Moulton, uh, which is a pay-what-you-want PDF game on Drive-Thru RPG. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, and I'm going to try and run it myself uh, pretty soon. Uh, it's like a 20-page PDF. So basically, you've made a deal with John Moulton, uh, this guy in the Wild West. Uh, well, it's a weird West now. Uh, and he gave you some sort of demonic power. And in order to, but now you want to catch up with them. You want to, you know, you, maybe you want to kill him. Maybe you want to renegotiate terms of your deal. Maybe he can do something for you or you need answers from him. Whatever. You make that up. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're on a quest to find him and all the players are on the same quest. And so you cho- you sort of group, uh, everyone sort of as a group collaboratively comes up with their powers. Like you come with a power and then you have to pay a price to use your power. So like one player, his, his ability was to come up with any, like a small object. You could just make, you could just pull anything out of its pocket. Mm-hmm. The thing is though, one, to use the power more than once per session, you have to pay a price. And so like his was like, yeah, I have to cut something off. I have to pay a pound. I have to pay like, like uh, I have to cut off some of my flesh like <laughs> so um you know fingernails bye bye you know? <laughs> yeah you know, uh for me it was like i could see what the person truly desired and if i my price was i had to eat something's eyeballs to do that so um <laughs> mm. yeah and so you also as a group you sort of collaboratively come up with like what this small fucked up town you, you're you're following it john Moulton trail and he's yeah. just leaving a trail of like towns where the water's gold now or you know people are flying you know or <laughs> Um, or in our case, people were turning into animals, you know, it was like, and you know, it was weird West Dr. Moreau, you know, yeah. like figure out what was going on. And so you collaborate, come up with who's there and what's going on. And then it's got interesting mechanics. So it's a really fun, uh, it's, and it's also meant for like, it's primarily aimed at one shots. Yeah. So like the mechanics are like, you can do really cool things. But eventually, your character will die. Like if yeah. you push yourself too far, your uh, 
your your resources, your attribute when your one uh, uh, your your resources attributes will go down to one, and then you're dead. So mm-hmm. like, um, yeah. So anyways, that was the second game that I played, um, and this is just a weird indie ash can game that I'd never heard of before. Yeah. So, um, did you find any of the ash cans really interesting? Um, that you bought or whatever. I haven't had a chance to. I mean, passion to those passiones is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, the ward I really want to try because it's a, it's a medical drama game. Oh, okay. Uh, and I kind of want to design one of those. So is that using Powered by the Apocalypse? Or yeah. It's, okay. Yeah, uh, it's Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, and yeah, so I'm interested to try those out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mainly, I bought board games. Um, <clears throat> Bunny Kingdom is adorable, and the art is great. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I got a copy of that. Um, I really wanted to try uh, the Castle of Mad King Linwood, but I heard Palace is cooperative. Yeah. Uh, so I really bought. I really wanted that. So I bought Palace of Mad King Ludwig. Uh, I bought Climbers because I really like games with verticality. And that's, oh, that's the like, one with the wooden blocks, right? Yes. Uh, so it's about climbing to the top of a yeah. disassembled tower. Um, and then. I ended up being talked into some stuff by Jeremy Fish, uh, who spent the majority Woo, of the time. He talked me into some things, too. He was a native marketing gold mine. Whatever you're paying him, double it. Um, <laughs> and he was hanging out with us. So he talked me into uh, Wasteland Express Delivery Service. He also talked me into a game I never thought I'd play, but I really want to play it with um, Jason and Renee, because I, I, I get the wargaming thing, but conflict is like, a little too it, it, much. It's 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 a steep buy-in. Yeah, steep both buy-in. figuratively and literally. Yeah. Uh, so WizKids has this new game they were showing off at the con um, that wasn't even out in full release yet, called Seal Team Flicks, mm-hmm. and I demoed it, and it's insane. Uh, so it's got seven different maps, six different playable characters, all with unique loadouts that you can load them up with using cards. Uh, it's got these standees that you go on these seven different maps. It's got campaign gameplay, which the scenarios change. It's based on off success and failure of previous uh, gameplay. Um, and you're moving your standees around. It's got an advanced AI system with all these colored cubes that are numbered, and it has, like, patrol routes of different guys. And it's, like, this intense SWAT tactical, like, check your corners... Like, uh, all that kind of stuff. Shooter, except the resolution mechanic for what is essentially just a basic board game, a basic war game, like, without miniatures, uh, so at least a finite cost, is a dexterity game. Like, when you want to shoot someone, if you flick a disc at them, and if you're shooting a fucking saw, it's a big ass disc. And if you're shooting your pistol, it's a tiny little blue disc. And if you hit them, they're hit. And if you don't hit them, and if you hit your other teammate, they're hit. And like it is like friendly fire and all that kind of stuff. Uh, when you want to hack a door, you roll these dice to randomly generate numbers, and they put it on an actual keypad. And the goal for hacking the door is you have this many flicks to knock all of the discs off the keypad, but the keypad is randomized on these dice rolls. So, like, I got three things to get rid of four numbers off of it. When you want to snipe, there's this little runner shuffleboard with a terrorist head in the middle of it, and you have to flick and land on the head space, depending on damage. And it's got all these interesting little subsystems that's basically just a dex... But it's a dexterity game, like, flick them up, but with, like, the most intense back end ever, with, like, hostage negotiation mechanics and, like, intense scenarios and choice points. And, and it's just, it, it's got noise counters and stealth mechanics. <laughs> um, so... I did I, demo that. Yeah, no, it's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Can't really anything is under like selling them. Like <laughs> yeah. the board I really like the board has a little slightly raised things to represent walls. So like, yeah. you can see it's not just like But you can't just shoot through them. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a SWAT game. Like it's like a SWAT shooter if as a war game, except the resolution mechanic rather than rolling randomly rolling dice. Or rather than like getting out the tape measure and seeing what the distance is, it's like, yeah. well, you'll hit him if you can flick it that far away, and like, it's a matter of actual skill for it. And, <laughs> and, and I just think it's uh, intensely interesting and like one of the weirdest like uh, this meets this game designs mm-hmm. I've ever seen. So like, Dix, wa- yes. while it's a little gung ho for me, like, yeah, like. 
<laughs> like you, it, it is like very much seal worship, like yeah. shooter McGavin, yep. first class, whatever. Uh, it, it's a little intense, but like the ridiculous of like that ended up being like boop yep. with a flick is. I'm just like, well, I have to buy this. Yeah, uh, uh, dexterity games are making are really becoming popular these days. Like, yeah, like some of them are really good, but uh, <laughs> some of some of them are just like. Meant for your kid to have a game night when the adults are also hardcore, like yeah, 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 Uh, gamers. But this is like, yeah, you wouldn't have your kid play this dexterity mm -hmm. game. It seems intense. Uh, Jeremy sold me another dexterity game, uh, Rhino Hero, and I forgot who it's. It's from a German publisher. Um, The one they they they, all their board games have like yellow edges. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, Oh yes, they sell the edu games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, They do Animal Upon Animal, which is another really fun dexterity game. If you uh, are ever drunk, yeah, don't so play I, it with kids drunk, or don't yeah. get the kids drunk. But you get drunk don't, and yeah. play and play animal upon animal. So you got it, it, yeah. Rhino here is like bending cards and using them to assemble towers, and mm-hmm. like that sounds like a great game to play. Buzzed. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we need to do that next after the next mix six. Um, so uh, yeah, another uh, uh, actually RPG that I got to play with the designer, uh, not the designer, but a designer was Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, it was run by Brendan LaSalle, who's the creator of X Crawl. He's written a bunch of DCC stuff. And I'm going to, um, and, you know, we've done a lot of DCC. You've played DCC. Yeah. Uh, but we've always as done. As it was meant to be played. As it was meant to be played. The level zero peasant funnels. Yes. And those are ridiculously fun. And I love the game. And, but they, it, the DCC rule book is hundreds of pages long. And they have all these rules for more than peasant adventures. And I was curious about that nonsense. And see, it, well, it was it's a different kind of nonsense. Sounds like heresy to me. <laughs> you see, you're getting the character for 40k. Um, so uh, this was uh, so Brendan ran uh, a 10th level DCC adventure that was basically a boss fight with a demon. Lord. Shouldn't be allowed. It was allowed, and it was awesome. You know what? A boss fight with a demon lord would be even better if instead of six 10th level characters, yeah. You sent in 60 zero level characters. <laughs> that would be way better. There was literally one of the things he did. I was like, he was a demon lord of storm. So he's like, hey, he summons a storm that does 1d6 damage to everyone. So it would have been a very short fucking fight. Like, everyone's just ripped apart. <laughs> and it would have been great. <laughs> Uh, one of the players did DCC is meant to be played like fucking door fortress yeah. man you win when you it, die it was it was it was well it, it, I mean we we did win uh, but in the most door fortress way uh, and one of the players did have a pig which he role played as his therapy pig and we polymorphed it into a dragon <laughs> Uh, and we, I mean, it was a great, yeah, the choice had a lot of extra attacks that way. Um, but DCC actually has a lot of inter- interesting mechanics for high level play. Um, and one of them is that spells are spell check, like you have to roll on the, uh, and then consult the table to see what your spell actually does. It's not the same effect every single time. And there's multiple ve- effects. And if you roll higher, you can pick a lower effect if you want. And so we actually, everyone at the table actually had some familiarity with DCC. And we, so we actually utilized basic teamwork and synergy, <laughs> which Brendan was telling us later that like, uh, yeah, most of the people who, who show, show up with this venture have no idea what to do. They haven't, ne- they haven't even played DCC before. So if they teach them the rules, they don't know what they're doing. They just die. You yeah. know, the demon Lord wins. Uh, but because we were able to use basic teamwork, we were like, oh, we should do this and this and this. And then you should cast this spell that why, you know, will hurt his ability to cast spells. Well, we rolled real. Well, the thing is, and it's called Mind Purge, I believe. Uh, and we wanted one particular result on the table. It's like reduce the target's intelligence and personality to three, which <laughs> is like the minimum in D and D in DCC. <laughs> and we're like, and it normally says no save allowed, but do well, Brendan, he's a team where he's super badass. He gets a save. And so he takes out this big D 20. That's like the size of an egg. It's a big, it's a large <laughs> die. Uh, and he rolls it and it's, and it's a natural one. <laughs> and we're like, ah! And we're like, well, I guess this is what the story's going to be about. <laughs> he starts running away. Well, and he's really fast because he's 60 feet tall. Well, we teleport in front of him and then kneecap him. <laughs> and then we just go to town with this demon lord. And the rest of the adventure is us divvying up. Like, we turn him into a statue, literally. Like, turn him to stone. And then cut him up into six parts and give him to our very... Like, what are we going to do with our parts of our demon lord? Because that's the loot. And all these deities and kings and lords 
want to have parts of a demon lord because it's a great you know it's a it's a great conversation uh, icebreaker you know yeah. it's a great trophy for you know mm-hmm. if you're a dwarven king turn that stone demon lord into an archway and mm-hmm. but leave its ear intact so you can <laughs> talk shit into the demon lord like fuck you demon lord you know <laughs> and uh so that was really fun actually yeah. and i'm gonna try and email uh, Brendan to try and get his notes so I can run it for RPPR because nice. this would be the perfect this is the adventure for Bill and Dan like <laughs> this oh, is yeah. this is like you I will you here's the gauntlet has been thrown down you do this mm-hmm. you know and you can you, you I'll give you all the time you want to learn DCC and min max your character that night. Uh, no no Kale come no, on I'm busy <laughs> I, got, I gotta wash my hair <laughs> uh, so that was the third game that I played uh, and then of course we both played Ironetta yeah, uh, which uh, is recorded. Yeah, which is recorded. Um, what are your impressions of the game overall? I mean, the system and everything. Oh, I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it's very much uh, fate and the new system. It seems like meets an apocalypse world playbook. So you can mm-hmm. write your own aspects, but you do have a sort of class or uh, archetype. Mm-hmm. And that has specific moves built into it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's fun. I had a good time. Yeah. Uh, we had we also we played with not just us but Jeremy and also two other RPPR fans. Shout yes. out to Jacob and Rhea, I believe, yeah. uh, who were great role players. Actually, they really liked the and we were actually not super violent in our game. We were just like you know we're gonna peacefully you know not you know we were still Vikings, but it was yeah, not we like we would it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tracy was telling me like yeah a lot of fights you know in some of the other sessions I've run the players into the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like well we didn't do that. <laughs> we made a new friend. Yeah, we made a new friend. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, I also ran Red Markets. Uh, that was pretty oh, yeah. pretty well done. Uh, so <laughs> they didn't want to play with a ton of bust rules. So we just did random damage, and they didn't want to do the other hit rules. So a lot of leg damage happened. <laughs> um, so <laughs> they get up there, and they're all half dead because uh, they got in a fight in the sewer, and they had one flashlight. And so a mob came at him from the front, and so they're picking away at it. And then I'm like, and then the mob from the rear. And so, like, the guy in the middle was flashing back and forth around to, like, put the flashlight on the mob so other people could shoot him, while, and, which left the other person blind fighting in the dark. Uh, so, like, he'll turn around so he could shoot at the mob getting closer to him from behind. And he turns back around, and, like, the latent's buried under four zombies drowning in sewer water. <laughs> and wow. so they get up, and they're barely alive. And then um, uh, Jeremy, uh, not Jeremy Fisher, different Jeremy, uh, got into a guard station at the facility they were trying to raise. And he, he pulled a real errand in that he wanted a non-lethal kill. So he kept on calling a shot with his axe handle after failing his stealth check uh, against a guy with a pistol. <laughs> so he gets shot in the leg and he's bleeding out completely. <laughs> and so then, that's okay. And then another character gets shot in the leg as you know he just keeps on trying to wang this guy in the head non-lethally with an axe handle. And the guy's just like... Shoots him. <laughs> yeah. So they finally kill the guy, and the, the doctor character gets in there. And they've already had um, one character go. They gave them the suppressin because they got bit in the tunnel, which was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they gave Bryce the suppressin, which is smart, Bryce, because you were infected. <laughs> um, and he, he was already turning latent and just screaming and writhing on the ground and bleeding out. And uh, both of them are bleeding out. The doctor has to get to one. So he gets to the latent. In the <laughs> that basically killed himself, um, and he's like, "All right, I'm going to do the first aid check," and like he's been rolling gangbusters all night, and he's like, "One, one crit fail." <laughs> oh, <laughs> and so I do it, and like bleeding out st- goes, goes with stun damage, so it fills him up with stun damage, and I'm like, "All right." From here on out, he's going to have everything's filled with stun. I know how many boxes are filled with stun. But I'm going to roll for every round it takes to do it. And then if he dies, he is a latent. So he's going to turn. <laughs> and, but you can keep working on it. You could keep saving it. <laughs> and the doctor looks at the other latent bleeding out from the same wound in the leg, gotten in a different part of the facility. He's like, nah. And he just domes him. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's like, triage is a thing. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, we're all going to red markets. And everyone's like making humanity checks. And yeah. Like, Man, I'm glad I wasn't there to see that. I'm like, you were wearing specs, weren't you? He's like, yeah. Y'all about Gulnet? Yeah. The guy was like, no, you see that. <laughs> you get a POV view of it. Like, uh, so it was it was a pretty good red markets game. It so wait, the player fun. who died was the one who was trying to axe handle an enemy? Yes. Yeah. And then. Uh, Good call there. <laughs> as the doctor runs in and just shoots the guy in yeah. the head. Yeah. And then, lo- oh, the fight stops. Weird. Yeah. He's already, like, perforated and bleeding out of his leg. Uh, but, yeah, it got, it got pretty <laughs> wild. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about Red Markets. It's just everything's fine until suddenly things can go pear-shaped so quickly. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It, goes, it goes from normal to so bad so quickly. It's great. <laughs> yeah. um, so... Uh, speaking of bloody encounters, uh, <laughs> I did also some more gaming stuff. Um, this group called the Fan Community of Gamers, I believe, and uh, I'm not 100% sure on the name, but they, it's just a group of people who like games and they run games at Origins. They're not. I was working the booth or I would yeah. have gone to with you to, <laughs> to this. I to really this. wanted to play this fucking it game. It was so fun. This is it's called, they, they have this unofficial thing. It's not published. It's not online anywhere. They just have it in a three ring binder and a bunch of laminated note cards and hundreds of Smurf figures, Smurf toys. Uh, and it's called Smurf Wars. And it's just pick five Smurfs. And then you pick your Smurfs and there's a number written on the bottom of each one. And that corresponds to the uh, laminated note card that has your stats on it. And you, that, that's your team. And last Smurf standing My wins. My favorite part is that you just pick based on what they look like. Yeah. Like, you have yeah. no idea. <laughs> you have no idea of like... Yeah, what they get actually do. What they do. do. My favorite was the one you told me about that was in a Superman outfit. Yeah. And it turned out they were just cosplaying and they had <laughs> no powers whatsoever. <laughs> yes, that was one of my guys. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that, that, uh, yeah, he looks cool. He looks tough. Oops, nope, he's totally <laughs> shitty. Good good job there. Um, one of my others, one was a lion. Uh, he was like, like they had they had signs of the Zodiac Smurfs. Like, I have no idea where the fuck they're getting all these Smurf figures from. Like, uh, so I had Leo Smurf. Uh, who was you know? He also had cancer smurf. I had cancer smurf. Yeah, MVP. Yeah, he was a crab. Fucking like claws, yeah. man. And armor, which is actually really rare. He was good at defending. <laughs> um, and then I had the Grim Reaper Smurf, uh, an Alchemist Smurf, uh, who could throw al- Alchemist fire. He was just fucking lobbing Molotovs <laughs> at people. I didn't know it had splash damage, so. <laughs> Oops, uh, kind of wanged my ally once and myself because I didn't know about that. Um, and yeah, you it's just five, it's just six players, last from our standing, but you could form temporary alliances. So I formed one with the one player, and then uh, it's just this three hours just fucking brawl as we're just like it. The rules were simple, but they're easy to learn. Um, and they made it good as a multiplayer event because like they had a lot of random events that th- shook up the battlefield and also the smurfs were very mobile it was like on a, a square grid map but you can move eight uh, usually eight squares per move and so like you could just dash across the battlefield pretty yeah. so like it wasn't just like you know a lot of games you're like oh i get to here and then i keep attacking until i'm dead yeah but in this one we were just moving all over um but like you, they use playing cards to resolve the fights instead of dice. So you draw a card, the other person draws a card. Aces are low, and whoever gets a higher number wins. Um, and but if if you draw a Joker, then Azriel shows up, and Azriel the cat will like run from one point on the battlefield to another, and any Murph under in the way takes damage. Yeah, fucking Azriel fucked up my team <laughs> so badly. I got hit by that motherfucker like four or five times. Uh... He was a son of a bitch. Fuck you, Azriel. <laughs> um, and then if you if both players draw the same number card, like both sevens or whatever, then there's a random event. They consult a random event table, and then like literally one of them was like, "Oh, there's a paternity test for Smurfette," and this and this uh, person who was fighting runs away because he's the father. You know, <laughs> lose that character. Like <laughs> it was just like dumb, like kind of fun homebrew <laughs> stuff. Like it, it wasn't meant to be bounced. It was just simple and fun. It was a great, you know, uh, con game. Yeah, it was a great con game. They had a whole map. Uh, like they had like actual Smurf houses and shit. Like uh, it was great. So yeah. 
Yeah, there were some elaborate war game setups. Yeah, uh, that I saw in Hall A. Like they had some crazy. That uh, giant galleon mm-hmm. was fucking crazy looking. The yeah, floating the giant island pack. setup was really yeah, cool. Yeah, the floating island. I kind of got a little sick. Like I saw them other people playing it. It was basically like PVC pipes overhead to hang up like literal floating uh, terrain islands yeah. and skyships. Although it looked a little, those PVC, PVC pipes were kind of a little wobbly. <laughs> for your uh, taste. Yeah, for your taste. Because like they literally had to like, okay, move your skyship six inches forward. So they had like hooks overhead to, and they had to <laughs> adjust them on the PVC pipe. And like, okay, that seems... Like, that's mm, a tragedy waiting to happen. Um, they also had, like, a Warhammer setup table uh, with a giant submarine, but it was orc-made, so it was, like, really kind of, like, post-apocalyptic Mad Max looking, and yeah. they, they called that battle the Hunt for Red Orktober. Um, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> um, and if I knew it, well... Uh, I didn't get into that, but um, well, I didn't try to get into that. No. Uh, we found a cool thing. So Van Ryder Games, um, Sarah found these, and, and I bought them too because uh, they're so cool. They're, um, they're choose-your-own-adventure graphic novels, which is, which is great. Um, then you can choose your own adventure based on the choices and the captions and, and whatnot for the panels. But there's also like hidden numbers and stuff in there that you can find that are like hidden choices you could do. So it's kind of like a found object game. And then they're full blown single player RPGs. They have character sheets in the back, and you keep track of your character sheets as you run through this sort of choose your own adventure um, thing. And like they are really cool. So we bought um, from Van Ryder Games. We bought a number of those because they are pretty pretty spiffy uh sarah played one last night and got eaten by spiders uh so she's gonna have to start over there uh but yeah like as long as you do a photocopy of the character sheet in the back of the book you could reuse it endlessly yeah. so i'm gonna definitely gonna try and bring them to school but they're they're pretty uh pretty spiffy um also speaking on the education front uh his name eludes me but there's a he's dominating kickstarter right now uh, with science-based games, like he's got one about peptides and one about viruses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I bought the the board game for Cytosis. Uh, oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. he is. Uh, he is killing. It. Sarah actually knows him from high school. Uh, so we were we we bought that because you know I want to support that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I did mount some games too, uh, board games uh, in the the spare time that you know in between events and whatever. Um, I did last Friday, which is a slasher. The Friday the Thirteenth kind of knockoff game, yeah, um, seemed very simple. Like it's played in multiple phases. We mm-hmm. just played through the first phase. It took about twenty minutes. All the campers escaped because the person playing the killer picked the wrong spot to start in. Yeah, um, and it just eh, it didn't really grab me. Yeah, so I maybe 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 play that at a game store or something before you buy it asymmetry would, is hard to do as, uh, speaking of race yeah it is and a speaking of asymmetry um there was another game i, I demoed uh that really focuses on that the vast and mysterious manner oh uh, yeah that's on kickstarter yeah it's a it's there is uh, made by the same person who created vast which is another asymmetrical game so in vast mysterious manner which i did demo uh there's like five roles um and i played the paladin the paladin every every role has a different goal. Uh, so the paladin's goal is to kill the spider, mm-hmm. and then there's the skeletons, and their their goal is to kill the paladin. The spider's goal, I forgot what it was, um, but it's I mean it's on the Kickstarter page. It's it's interesting because there's no dice. You just allocate like basically action points on various activities to you know move and explore the manor or fight monsters and. As you do so, you you gain experience, and then you get more action points to do more things. Um, but while you're doing this, the skeletons are doing their own thing. The spider's doing its own thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that because, like, is you could be playing your game very well, and you have no idea how close the other player is. I mean, I guess in some cases, like, if the skeleton, you know how well the skeleton's doing because you're either full of health points, you know, hit points, or you're, you're dead, you know. So, like... Mm-hmm. Um, it's very good art. It looks very cool. If it wasn't, I, I looked at the Kickstarter. It's like seventy five bucks for the base game. So I'm like, mm. um, especially after all the money it's been at uh, Origins. Um, 
also I did uh, I demoed Big Trouble in Little China, which is another very complex, very luxurious kind of board game. Man, the minis are gorgeous in it, though. They are very well sculpted. Uh, they have all the characters in the movie. Yeah, um, huge board too. Uh, and double sided. Double sided. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Double sided. Um, because it's not only like Little China; it's also Low Pan's Lair. Yeah, it's some heavy cardboard. <sighs> and uh, the thing is, um, like every player has different quests, and so like you go around the board doing different missions to try and complete the story. Mm-hmm. And there's multiple trackers. Uh, like there's literally a big trouble tracker. There's also an audacity tracker, uh, which measures different things. And there's a lot of things to keep track of. So basically it's, it's sort of, it's uh, the gameplay is similar to Arkham horror in that there's a lot of shit to keep track of. And there's a lot of sort of narrative based play. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a big investment of time. Uh, it looks like, but I mean, you have a Gloomhaven box yeah. sitting next to this table, so yeah. I'm not sure you can. Yeah, no, be I, talking I'm shit, not. Sir. I, well, yeah, well, you notice I haven't played it yet either because <laughs> yeah, it is scary. Yeah. So, like, now that I have Gloomhaven, I'm like, I'm definitely not getting a game like that. I, I will say that this was my first foray into the realm of inserts. Um, oh yeah, broken and token. Speaking or of Gloomhaven, yeah, because uh, holy shit. Talk about a game that could use some inserts. Yeah, Broken um, Token had one, but it was $80. Yeah. And I got Gloomhaven for $100. So, like, yeah. <laughs> but, like, it makes sense, though. So, I bought um, I bought Spencer a, game, a Scythe insert because he uses it. He plays Scythe all the time and he can get it out much faster now. Um, but, like, they, I also got Azul. So, Azul is, a, we love that game, but the, we got some plexiglass overlays for Azul that like keep your tiles in place and your little score tracker. Um, and then another game I was really intrigued with was Terraforming Mars, uh, which is uh, very realistically science-based on like the actual requirements to terraform Mars. Uh, and I hear it's a fantastic engine builder and a lot of people love it. Um, but the reviews I've read of it is like, I would love this game, but the player board requires you to put all of these different little square tokens down to keep track of your score and then it also keeps track of your score but your engine so like your conversion rates for like oxygen and heat and plant life which is like the entire point of the game it's an engine builder you're trying to get up big build bigger conversions um and if and everything i heard is like if you bump that table once your game is over and you'll have no idea where you're at uh because like all of those little squares are going to go out of their hole and it's just a little piece of like paper that you're laying it down on. Um, so we're like, I really want to get terraforming Mars. They're running out. So we went to this one insert place where we got the Azul plexiglass things, and they were pretty expensive. And so I wasn't thrilled about that, but we play Azul all the time. So we're going to do that. So we go, and it's like 40 bucks just for the plexiglass to lay over this $70 game. So then we go over into Broken Token. I'm like, well, they have a terraforming Mars thing. I wonder how much their plexiglass thing is that they sell it. So they had everything for 40 bucks, And I mean, like, it sorts everything. You can get the game out in five minutes, like, and it's ready to go. And they also, like, redid the player boards because a lot of people said they didn't have enough numbers on them. So they did their own version of the player boards. And then they had a printout on it. So, like, looks even more professional. And the cool thing is, is, like, they have a little tray on top of the broken token insert to where all the little cubes that you have to place things can go right in there so like you don't even have to get things set up like once you put the game away it's instantly ready to play again and so i'm like and i was looking at how it's constructed and i'm like i i got my i i I hit a new achievement in board game nerd because i'm just like wow the the engineering of this thing is enough for me to appreciate it. So I bought that just because I wanted to play Terraforming Mars and not deal with that crap. And it was the same price as, like, one of the components from the other place. And uh, so, but yeah, the the Broken Token place was, like, some of the worst customer service I've ever received. Like, outside the sales floor, when I was, like, trying to check stuff out, the guy was like, hey, what do you want? And then I, like, tell him, and he, like, doesn't respond. He just, like, turns and leaves. And I'm like, is he is he kidding? Is he He sort of snatched the card away from me. And, like, what I realized is, like, 
oh, it's because, like, it doesn't matter. Like, you, you need them. Like, they're serving a vital function. It's like, they don't they don't need to be nice to you. Your dealer like, doesn't have to be nice. Yeah. They, yeah. Um, and so that was pretty interesting, especially with a game like Wasteland Express, which, like, middlemans that for you. Yeah. And it's just like, holy shit, this is, like, game-changing. Like, this this game would be so complex. It looks like a nightmare of little components because it's all over in minis and all over the place. And, like, I watched, like, half of the video. I'm like, no, I got how to run that now because, like, everything's all neat and organized and layout. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really have appreciated uh, box organization and inserts more than I ever thought I would get nerdy and excited about something as a result of my Origins experience. Yeah. Wow. Um <laughs> One other uh, vendor that I'd like to mention, uh, not a board game vendor, but actually Reaper Miniatures. Um, because, one, I picked up, they, have, they, they do a full line of different types. Well, they don't have game a game specific for Reaper. They just do like, oh, we have fantasy minis and sci-fi minis and modern and pulp minis. They also stuff. have a mini painting starter That's kit. That's exactly what I was going, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is uh, really cool. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention because apparently Sarah went there and just painted minis for free. Like, they just give you a Well, mini. you have a generic ticket, but yeah. Yeah, they'll, oh, okay. They'll yeah. give you a leftover mini and they'll like give you a couple lessons and yeah. you get two hours to just paint your miniature. She's really uh, good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I did not know about that uh, until, well, I was busy doing other events, but I did pick up a couple things from Reaper, including some things I'm going to use as object, uh, objective markers for uh, Warhammer, or not Warhammer, uh, Conflict 47, uh, including a phone box, uh, you know, TARDIS kind of thing, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just a scientist, like a. 1930s, 40s looking scientist guy. So. I will say there was some mini stuff there, but yeah. I was kind of stunned because, like, uh, as much board gaming stuff as there was around, I was expecting, like, an equivalent mini presence because, mm-hmm. like, aside from two big players, everyone from the board game space is at Origins. Yeah. But, like, the... There was not as big as a mini presence at Origins as no. at all as it in like Gen Con. I mean, there are mini Gen Con. Cons. A third of the floor is like these gorgeous, yeah, uh, you know, decadent minis displays and yeah. like these huge rose bones. And there were a couple like mini wholesalers out there, but um, yeah, other than Reaper, it, uh, I was I was pretty alarmed. It wasn't it wasn't well, as there, hard as Malifaux the was there. Malifaux, which is a big uh, mini thing. Games Workshop actually had a booth there, mm-hmm. uh, although it was, looked shitty. Like he was just like, yeah, we they got, were a lot smaller than they are. Gen Con. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was just like, here's your shit. Mm, you, you know, you you know, you're gonna buy it. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah the give, broken token sales. Pitch. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> buy this shit, nerds. You need it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, well the minis games. I mean, I think there 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 are separate minis cons and sort of a you know there's like Adepticon and other places that are really minis focused. And I think again, yeah, Gen Con. Um, like uh, one thing that annoyed me, uh, going back to Gamma being terrible at organizing thing, was apparent like in their thing list of exhibitors, Warlord Games is there. Warlord Games is the manufacturer, the maker of Conflict Forty Seven. Oh yeah, they weren't uh, there. They weren't there. <laughs> I spent 30 minutes looking for their fucking booth. I was like, it's got to be in here. Where else could it be? I've literally been everywhere. Then I go, I, I literally searched the, all three exhibit halls. And then like, I go to the, like, where is it? Oh, they're over in that corner. And I go over there. Oh no, we're just fans who are running events to teach you how to play conflict 47. But we really prefer bolt action, you know? <laughs> And like I'm like, well So Gamma needs its own like yeah. spoof soundbite. <laughs> yeah. Da, 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 <laughs> yeah. Gamma <laughs> Yeah, basically. <laughs> um it's just <laughs> We moved your red markets game to the roof of the hotel. Ba da ba da da ba Gamma uh, Yeah. And then, well, another thing is also uh, one one minor thing. Um Adam Thornsburg from Roleplay Exchange uh showed up for one day. Uh, and I hung out with him, and he was looking for Greg Bennett was there. As yeah, well. Greg Bennett. Uh, a lot of wonderful fans. What? Just great people. Uh, everyone who hung out with us is a beautiful human being. <laughs> um, and Adam wanted to get a Doctor Seuss Call of Cthulhu or Doctor Seuss style Call of Cthulhu uh, book for his kid, and uh, Chaos. I mean, sold out. Then I remember Atlas Games. They have some Cthulhu themed kids books. And uh, so I go to the Atlas booth. It's like, where are they? I didn't hallucinate this, did I? It's like, oh, no, we have another booth in the other hall. I'm like, oh, I'm not crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, That is another thing for Origins. So, like, Origins will have booths that 
you'll have certain publishers that'll have booths in the dealer hall where they're selling stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll have second booths that also sell stuff in A and C, which is the play spaces. So, like, Come On Games had had a booth where they were selling stuff in the dealer hall, and then they also had the... Actually, no, they didn't. Come On Games had an enormous booth in dealer hall A where you could play the games, and also, like, where they were selling Rising Sun and Blood Rage and stuff like that. But they weren't in the dealer's hall at all, whereas Stronghold Games had stuff in the dealer hall and it had a play space where they were selling stuff as did whiz kids and uh but pandasaurus was only in the dealer's hall and they were running their games out of there it was very odd like it was very split up like sometimes you'll have a booth that was both selling and running and then a secondary booth that is just selling uh and demoing and then sometimes they would only have the selling and running booth away from the dealer's hall if they were big enough to be like you're going to find us like you don't need to go to the place where everybody else is buying stuff. You'll, you'll get there. Um, and then, yeah, it was very odd. Like, and then places where I thought they would have huge play areas. They didn't like, yeah. Uh, so like whiz kids had a big dealer hall room and then all they were doing in the, over in the play space was hero clicks. And then everything else, like no one was running seal Tim six and flicks. Nobody was running anything else. Um, but like they were demoing all that stuff in their, in their, but it was it was very odd, like the split between yeah. things. It wasn't like, well, this is Gen Con. That's the Fantasy Flight complex. Wait in this line and then go inside. Yeah, and then go to this space that's nothing but tables that has a banner that says Fantasy Flight to play your games. Like it was very much all over the place. Like, um, so yeah, and there were like twilight imperial games popping up in the middle of like giant hero clicks play spaces just because somebody fucked it up so it'll be like you know i'm turning thanos to level seven and then they're next to the like dudes who've been there for 16 hours playing the same game of twilight imperium just like harrowed like their ties loosened looking down and like that's like they're doing their fucking taxes like it's just like Normally, there's like border. There are borders yeah. at Gen Con, whereas like yeah. Origins is a far more liminal space. Like, <laughs> uh, like at one point, I was running Party Flow next to a game of Twilight Imperium yeah. that had been going for presumably before the con started. Uh, and I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like, at that point, those guys had booked two tables: one for the game and one for their stuff. So they were just taking up a table with, like, coats and shit uh, and their food and, like, medication, I guess. I, like, was, it, was it you who found that entry and the – or an entry for – Oh, yeah. Like, no, Sarah. Sarah yeah. looked in the booth because, yeah. like, she, we were trying to find my game because it was yeah. not at the right table. And I, again, had to find a place right next to this Twilight Imper- Imperium game that was every expansion with eight players for and scheduled – Eight hours. Eight hours. And under the complexity, it said medium. (laughs) (laughs) And Sarah's like sitting next to me as I'm setting up fucking party foul, like as absurd as it could be next to it. And he's like, I'd hate to see hi, like, damn. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh so yeah. Gamma also allows damned lies when you're making <laughs> when you're making events, but yeah, man, um, yeah. There would the, another thing was also it seemed a lot of events were run at eight or nine in the morning. Uh, yeah, we, the the uh, play spaces will open up before the dealer hall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know Gen Con does that as well, yeah. but it seemed most of there were, Gen Con like I was, but the play spaces yeah. are not all connected to the dealer hall. Yeah, yeah. There's like I said, Origins, the Hyatt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, as in, uh, in the Hyatt was the Hyatt was very similar to the way Gen Con does it, but like yeah. the big halls, like A and B, mm-hmm. will like be available and running events. A and C, event. B, and C, yeah. A and C will be running events. Yeah, like at eight a.m. Yeah. And then the dealer hall won't open for two more. But hours. yeah, like I wanted to get in a game of Mutant Crawl Classics. Dungeon Crawl Classic was actually my backup game. Like yeah. uh, but Mutant Crawl Classics, all the games were at eight in the morning. And that's like Goodman Games new like sci fi RPG. And mm-hmm. I'm like, why are you doing this all at eight in the morning? Like <laughs> especially on a Saturday or a Sunday. Like no one's getting up at eight on a Sunday. Uh after four days of this con. <laughs> um and there, so there, there, just looking through the catalog, there's a ton of events early in the morning and then a ton of events at dinner time, and like not nearly as much as there's. I feel there should be like in the middle of the day or even like ten or eleven in the morning. 
Um, so that that maybe that was just a weirdness of origins or the, that year. I don't know if that's like uh, a demic, but like yeah, games on demand is like nine a.m. two p.m. like instead of like ten and three or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. It, it seemed it seemed a bit odd because you know. I no, I mean, I guess they assume most of the people going to Origins are just at a connected hotel or something. They're just going to wake up and mm-hmm. go roll straight into the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we were pretty you lucky. You do kind of need a book early for Origins. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get a hotel. Yeah. Uh, but Airbnb was like a reasonable solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um. But yeah, it's not it's not completely laissez faire rolling yeah. when you feel like it. You need to do some prep, but it is decidedly less complicated than trying to get into Gen Con. Yeah. And uh, like I didn't sign up for any events. I just rolled in with generic tickets, got into everything I wanted, except for the game, the ones I didn't even try to because they were too early. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was pretty good. Uh, I did also go to a learn how to play Warhammer 40K, and it was terrible. But that yeah, I am going to leave for RPPR after hours because <laughs> I want to go on about it in link <laughs> about how terrible it was. Warhammer not being great, weird. Well, part of it was unique to the event and how it was run. Uh, You're right; it's not Warhammer's fault. It's a no. Perfect, I said p- in part, in part, in part. It was also because the rules were bad. All right, <laughs> fight me. <laughs> But not a Warhammer. Let's pick a good game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I remember, yeah, con- I mean, just even playing a different one war, different war game, uh, Conflict 47. I was like, holy shit, Conflict is way better than Warhammer. <laughs> yeah. Just to give you an example, in Warhammer 40K, you move your entire army at once. And then the other player goes. So, like, if you get lucky, you could just destroy a bunch of units and they never get to do anything. Like, <laughs> wow, that's fucking fair. Oh, wait, no, it's the opposite of that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, anyway, um, so yeah, I'm saving a bit of this for this, uh, uh, for after hours also, uh, as we play the games more. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I, the reason I spent such a stupefying amount of money yeah. on board games is because we're good on dissecting our funds for the, for the mix six for yeah. a while. And like- <laughs> I'm going to be reviewing the stuff. I'm going to be running a lot of things. Um, I know I'm going to be running the devil John Moulton. Uh, very soon, probably a couple times. I really liked it, uh, and I think you like it too, Caleb. Um, and uh, like, I got another. Oh, another game that I got: Tall Pines, which is a card-based storytelling game about uh-huh. replicating basically Twin Peaks. Yep. Um, I also got a copy of Harlem Unbound. I think I mentioned that, but um, I just read a couple pages of it. it looks really interesting, and I'm going to try and contact the game's writer, Chris Spivy, uh, try and get him to run a game for us at Gen Con or maybe online. Um, you know, the, uh, and of course, Fall of Delta Green. Oh, Ken Height told me that he named an NPC in Fall of Delta Green after me. Uh, there is a Admiral Peyton, uh, who is part of Delta Green. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, he's going to die horribly, obviously, because he's a Delta <laughs> Green agent. So, yeah. uh, but that, that's something. Um, and of course we have Ironetta coming up and, um, yeah, we'll do Wrath and Glory too. And yeah, who knows uh, what else we'll have up at our sleeve. So we'll be, you will be feeling the effects of this in the podcast for some time. So and on the mix six too. Yes, listen to the mix six. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. This has been RPBR episode one fifty six. Origins wrap up. Uh, talk to you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>